All right, it says we are live. Let me do my triple check here and make sure we're live. I never trust the internet. Oh man, no, I clicked the wrong thing. What are we doing here? Refresh this. Super excited about tonight's show. And it says we are live. Okay, awesome. Appreciate everybody tuning in. If you saw all the things today on Instagram and YouTube and everywhere else I've been posting, we got a special guest tonight, my new buddy, John McAdams. We hung out all last week, had an absolute fun time in Colorado hunting. There is a link in the video description down below. Go ahead and leave right now. Go subscribe to his channel and come back. I promise you won't regret it. If you like the Hootie Who videos, which I hope you do if you're sitting here watching, I know you're going to love his website and his YouTube, but I've got his YouTube down below. Y'all go ahead and leave real quick. Go subscribe to his channel. He has the Big Game Hunting blog. It's an awesome site. I can't direct link to it for, you know, we'll get in trouble with YouTube. But all that being said, let me bring in my buddy, John. Can you hear us now? Did I do it right? Yeah, you. Uh, I see you. I can hear you. Uh, I appreciate uh, you bringing me on the show here tonight, and I'm excited to be here and talk about guns and stuff with you. I'm excited, too. I've been excited about it for like a week. But like I said, we were hunting together last week in Colorado, and it took me, I think you were standing there next to the dinner table when it clicked in my mind who you were and that I had. I already knew you from the <laughs> internet, but... How I first was introduced to you and your content was I had just bought a 300 rum and I was looking up information and your video comparing 300 rum to some other cartridges popped up first. It was like a 30 minute video, real in-depth stuff. And I listened to it almost like podcast style while I was driving down the road. But give if, if I said, who are you and what do you do and what do you love? Give us your, your 30 second spiel on, um, uh, what people will get from your website and your YouTube and just everything about John in 30 seconds. Sure thing. Yeah. So his name is John McAdams. I live out in East Texas. I'm an army veteran. And I decided when I was getting out of the army or rather towards the end of my career in the army, and I wanted to, to do something else for a career. And I wanted to help hunters be more effective a field. And I figured the best way that I could do that was by digging in deep to specifically cartridge and cartridge comparisons this cartridge versus that cartridge like the 300 ultra mag versus the 300 win mag that that you found me with and then uh the specific bullets that work best in different cartridges for different applications because what you would use in a certain cartridge for deer and would work great for that might be a terrible choice to use on elk and vice versa and so that is really i really got my start uh, with the big game hunting blog. I started it in 2012, back when I was in Afghanistan. And wow. I really got my my initial traction on that thing doing cartridge comparisons. So my first one was the 308 versus the 30 out six versus the 300 Win Mag. And um, I just kind of took off from there and I'm still doing them. And actually, uh, people have subscribed to my YouTube channel tonight are probably going to get to see my next video, which is uh, another cartridge comparison that uh, <laughs> drops there tomorrow. Awesome. Everybody, make sure you got the notifications on and you're looking for that video tomorrow. Real quick, let me jump in. Scott O, you're a crazy man. <laughs> I appreciate you always tuning into the videos. Appreciate the super chat. We no longer have the monster truck, so we don't have to worry about it. <laughs> uh, so, um, all that being said, um, I love nerding out on the cartridge comparisons, but me and the way that my mind works, I'll do a video and you know what? Next day I'll forget everything I put in the video. I'll spend a couple days researching, doing the data and all this. Then I'll forget it. But guys, this guy, he doesn't forget. He remembers everything <laughs> there is about all these cartridges and just sitting there talking to this guy. He's like, oh, was that a 220 grain or a 205 or a 250? And I'm like, man, this, this guy, he's really sharp and he's got a really sharp mind. So if you have any questions, hit him up. Um, his podcast is awesome, has a whole lot of really good content on his podcast and his website. He's got articles. And if you're more into the YouTube stuff, you put a lot of your uh, articles on, on YouTube, too. Uh, that being said, let's go a little bit into 
the Colorado trip. So everyone that went with us got an antelope and a bison for the most part. Everybody that had an antelope tag got their antelope. So what did you choose to bring? First, let's talk about antelope. What did you bring for the antelope? Sure thing. So I took. And you, you, so I hate to interrupt you, but yeah, yeah. you being you being the expert on all this stuff, we already laid out. And why did you go with that one? Sure. You know, so kind of like you, I like using different stuff. You know, I'll shoot an animal with one thing, and then the next time I go in, go on, I want to use something else. And so, um, yeah. you know, you you know, you said that you want to use a you know uh, a different cartridge on everything. I'm not quite to that point, but I do want to use, say, a different bullet uh, on, on a bunch of different things. And so right now I'm working through all the real big name bullets from, uh, you know, Nosler, Hornady, all of that, Winchester, everything. So I brought a, a Bergara Wilderness Terrain in 6.5 Creedmoor on this hunt. And I used that same rifle to shoot what uh, is probably the biggest hog I've ever shot in my life. I shot it back in June with 125 grain Winchester uh, copper impact bullet worked great exited you know hog ran 80 yards and, and keeled over so i wanted to use something different and i wanted to use something a little bit more better suited to this hunt so hold on let, shot... me, let me pause real quick yeah that winchester one am i thinking about the right one it's fairly new and has a red tip on it yes mm -hmm. okay cool i'm on the same page gotcha yeah have, yes i've only used those in six eight western and they didn't group very well for me. But that 6.8 Western I have is kind of a, a lemon. Yeah. But. You know, that, that ammo actually worked real well for me in my 6.5 Creedmoor. And that rifle is kind of, my 6.5 Creedmoor is kind of weird. You know, 6.5 Creedmoors have a reputation for many of them. God, you feed them almost anything and they shoot it great. That's not the case of mine. It really likes that Winchester stuff. But since I already used it and I didn't think it would be, I thought it would be all right for antelope, but it wasn't I, what, what I considered to be ideal. So I was looking at all sorts of other stuff. So I used, I looked at that Barnes 127 grain LRX. It didn't shoot worth a darn. Uh, mm. Federal Trophy Ascent or Terminal Ascent didn't shoot yeah. worth a darn. Um, the, what's the other one? The Horn of the Outfitter 120 grain CX. I was also shooting like two, three inch groups with it. Ooh. And I was like, what? What the heck is going on with this with this thing? Like it shot the Winchester stuff great, yeah. um, and I shot the Winchester stuff again. I was like, you know, is, is something wrong with the rifle? And it shot it great. And I was like, you know, I, I'm gonna try one more thing in it, and we'll see how it works. And I shot the Hornady Precision Hunter, 143 grain ELDX, and I shot a five shot group, and they were you could almost cover them up with a quarter. It wasn't quite that good, but it was really good. And I was like, well, shoot, I guess this is what I need to uh, to use then. And so. That's like the most unoriginal thing to be using in a six five Creedmoor, and I say that lovingly yep. because it's a really, it's such a, it's such a really good uh, uh, ammo for people to use, and it's great for that sort of work that we were doing out there, where it, uh, it's a super high BC bullet, a um, lot higher BC than everything else I was shooting with all those other loads I just, I just mentioned, and man, it shot great. And um, you know, as you realize out there when you're shooting. What is potentially a long range shot yep. in some wind, man, you know, it can get kind of crazy out there and having a high BC bullet uh, stacks the odds a little bit in your favor with that. So that's that's the decision that I went with there. And I'll tell you, uh, I joke about the 6.5 Creedmoor all the time. I'm you know, like, like like everyone else does, but I really do like it. You know, I I, I kind of started out like trying to hate it and then it just kind of grew on me and I, and I really like it now. And um the when i got in the truck with my guide that first first morning he asked me what i was bringing i was like oh you know i got the 65 creed more he's like oh that's perfect that's, that's i love it when a guy shows up with the 65 creed more and uh you know he he used yeah. to hunt uh, with a 243 and uh, he said that he had a bunch of clients use 65 creed mores and they worked great and uh, then he bought one for himself and, and all of that and so um, like I said, I had this Bergara Wilderness Terrain, 6.5 Creedmoor, and um, I was kind of the odd man out in the group that I brought a suppressor with me on this hunt. And so I had a Banish 30, put it on there, and it shot great, and it, uh, you know, wasn't whisper quiet, but it was a lot quieter with the suppressor on than, than otherwise. And, yeah. um, and, man, it was just, honestly, the way things turned on that hunt, I don't think I could have uh, picked something that worked any better than that whole setup that I had out there. And I'm going to say it again. So John had a pon podcast episode come out this morning. When I woke up, it was already live. You must have had it come out at like midnight or something. 
I have them all come out at two in the morning. Yeah, ah, there you go. <laughs> and I listened to I listened to it again today. Uh, I, obviously, I was there when we recorded it. But I listened to the whole thing on the way to the range and back today. If you guys love just like what we're doing here, talking about hunting stories, I'm gonna say it again. Don't forget to go make sure you're following his podcast. The one today is a banger. I'm in it, so that makes it even better. Yeah, there you go, man. Yeah, <laughs> uh, but I can listen to stuff and talk about this stuff all day. Um, I eat it up. So y'all. Don't forget to subscribe to his channel and make sure you're following his podcast everywhere. So you 6'5 Creedmoor. Believe it or not, I've never taken anything with 6'5 Creedmoor. I have never taken 6'5 Creedmoor into the woods. I probably yes. have like 50 videos on 6'5 Creedmoor, whether we're <laughs> testing ammo or shooting it at a thousand yards. But I've never taken it hunting. Just, I don't know, kind of the whole cliche thing. I don't know. Everybody's doing it kind of a thing. I like to be weird. Maybe maybe that's a better way. To... Somebody just said well, man you... cartridge. Uh, in Indy said that's a man gun. <laughs> yeah. fair, fair enough, right? Fair like enough. Uh, everybody carries a Glock, so I'm not going to carry a Glock. I don't know. Well, I'll uh, tell you I'll tell you this. When we talk about the bison, I did not shoot the bison with a man bun cartridge. It was actually the farthest thing from it. So, don't worry. So, let's So, I'm going to plug mine real quick. I took uh then my wife beater is hanging out, and this is like really bothering me and looking weird. <laughs> I'm just gonna run the top button. Uh, Carbon says, "What's his channel again?" It's in the the link. Carbon, uh, there you go. It's in the description. Uh, go check it out. Make sure you're subscribed. Got the notifications on. Um, I lost my train of thought messing with my shirt. I think you were gonna talk about your antelope. Oh, right my now. antelope. I took with the 25 out six. That video's up on the channel if you guys missed it for some reason. It came out two days ago. Uh, go check it out. So, talk about antelope. You took 6.5 Creedmoor. I took 25.6. Now let's talk about the bison. And so walk us through your thought process coming up to the trip, what you plan on taking and all that stuff. You know, so I thought about taking a bunch of different things on that. And that was honestly the thing that was uh, – I spent the most time thinking about really because I thought the six five Creed more at least as far as stuff that I've had, yeah, that was kind of just a, a, a just a, a, almost perfect for it. I had shot two antelope previously, both with a three hundred wind mag, and that was fine. But uh, I wanted to use something different, and I had that Creed more, and I was like, okay, perfect, right? I think your twenty five out six is also like say twenty years ago, like that was like the antelope cartridge, and it's still a it's still a real classic antelope cartridge, super flat shooting. Uh, you know, real good for that little, that more open terrain like that, but it's not as overkill as, as like a 300 win mag or, or something like that. But nothing wrong with anyone that does that. But I, you know, I, I thought about seven millimeter mag. I've got a Seiko or Saco, depending on how you want to say mm -hmm. it. And it, man, it'll put them in the same hole. I thought about bringing that one, but yeah, I, went I mean, it's. Well, there. You, I mean, like you said, you wanted to shoot something with everything, and so now you checked off the twenty-five out six, and you can work on the creed more later, and 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 all of that. But I ended up shooting my bison with a three seven five H and H, and so you know, whole other category from everything else everyone else was using. You know, yep. I mean, you you put that up next to the the six five creed more, and it looks like you know probably your six year old son standing next to you out there is how those two cartridges are with each other. Yep. So I sh shot that antelope with 147 grain bullet and I shot my bison with a 300 grain bullet. And um, it uh, actually, I got I actually recovered one of my bullets from it right there. So that is the 375 bullet I recovered from it. And just for comparison, this is a 180 grain 30 caliber bullet that I recovered. And so you stack that up. Gosh, it's like all backwards and stuff. I'm trying to trying to do this stuff. Yeah, you got to move the wrong way. <laughs> uh, but you look how much bigger that three seven five bullet is than the thirty caliber. Uh, you know that's 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 a man's gun right there. You know you could take. So I, it was a. They don't make it anymore. It's a Ruger M seven seven Mark two Safari Magnum and three seven five H and H, and it's a. You got a scope, on it, right? Yeah, it's got a scope on it. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's kind of weird how things work out. Um, uh, I used to live in El Paso and my neighbor died uh, when I was there and they had an estate sale and the kids were driving my wife crazy one Saturday. So I took them for a walk and I was like, oh, what's going on over here? And so I go walk in this house when they're having the estate sale 
and they got this rifle laying on the counter, right? And so it's an estate sale. They're selling everything, right? Their rugs, their plates and dishes. And this guy had this rifle and it looked like he wanted to go to Africa one day with it or something. It was set up real nice with a nice Zeiss scope and it had two mm. boxes of ammo. One was full and one had nine rounds shot out of it. And so I had 30 or uh, I guess 21 out of, uh, or I guess uh, 11 out of, out of 20 uh, rem remaining in it. And so uh, it looked like this guy bought that rifle, put a scope on it, sighted it in, shot nine rounds, and then never touched it again. Like it was in just immaculate shape and it was you know, selling for, for a good deal. Like, man, I don't really need this because I already have a 458 Win Mag and a 9.3 by 62, but I really want it. And so I bought it. And uh, when I was getting ready to go up to Colorado, I was like, you know, I'm just going to bring this just in case. I had my my 300 wind mag and I was probably going to use that. And when I got up there, I was like, ah, I'm going to take this. And as it turns out, I ended up killing my bison with it. And uh, Weston, the guy I was hunting with, he killed his bison with that rifle too. Uh, so it went from from just having a couple rounds through it and uh, to, to two bison down. And um, and I'm still shooting that original two boxes of ammo that I <laughs> that I got from the guy when I when I bought it too. And what but, are those? Um, are they nozzlers? Is that what you said? So or Yes, yeah, so it was Federal Cape Shock with a 300 grain Barnes TSX bullet in it. Federal and Cape Shock. If you were going to go to Africa and you were going to, you know, have a say a one gun safari and kill Cape Buffalo in planes game, that rifle and that ammo, perfect for it. You show up in the camp and show that to your PH, and he'd give you the big thumbs up, and he's like, "All right, let's go hunting." And um, the first shot on that bison with the 375, it was it was moving a little bit. And I shot him on the shoulder and it hit a little behind the shoulder, he was slightly quartering away. Um, so it hit him, say, towards the back of the ribs, angled forward, hit the liver, back of both lungs. And um, he kind of turned and was kind of picked up the pace a little bit and was going a little bit uh, faster away. And I shot him right in front of his hip with my second one. And that bullet went all the way from his right rear hip all the way up to his left front shoulder. And uh, that's so over. No, so uh, so the the one I actually recovered two bullets stopped in him, and the one that I recovered was the first one. The other one was so deep buried up into his shoulder we couldn't get it out. So we're hoping the butcher's going to get it out. Oh, um, wow! But that thing that that bison had a hole about the size of a golf ball all the way through uh, his um, his left lung where that raked up through it. Yeah, and he staggered and laid down after that, and then looked back and I shot him in the neck again at about 150 yards and, and that was the end of that there and so i mean i was i was amazed at the amount of penetration that i got the guys mm -hmm. were like oh you, you hit him a little far back on that other one and uh well you know i was trying to rake it up forward and my goodness that is that is what it did man um that i was very impressed with the penetration of of that round you know it's got over four thousand foot pounds of muzzle energy i don't know Ooh. what it was what it was doing out there but uh it was it's it's it still brought the uh brought the horsepower out the even past 100 yards on them so i've never had a 375 i've never had one in my hands i've never even looked at a box of ammo i don't want to put you on the spot too much but could you give us a little bit of a history lesson on 375 sure yeah so the 375 kind of came along at a time of transition when they were moving from black powder into smokeless powder rifles and so the british uh had a bunch of colonial possessions in what's now India and what is now Africa. And so they wanted uh, to have some a, a couple of good rifle cartridges that would work well for the guys hunting in both of those places. And so they designed it to use what was uh, the, the smokeless propellant that they used a lot at the time, which was called cordite. And if you look it up online, cordite's really weird. It's not a powder. It comes in sticks. Like if you pull a bullet off the old 303 British, and pour it out it looks like a bunch of little straws coming out of it it's really weird really and so yeah uh but you know so it, it was designed i think 375 came out 1912 something like that but in any case um so it's an old cartridge and cordite was very very temperature sensitive meaning if you shoot it in the united kingdom and it's 40 degrees outside you'll get this velocity with it you take it to Africa where it's 110 degrees and shoot it, and it'll shoot 100 feet per second faster or, or more. Wow. When it's hotter outside, it shoots faster. And so 
it develops more pressure and that causes all kinds of problems. And so they built that cartridge to have a very, very uh, tapering body shape to it. If you look at it and, you know, I don't want to get you in trouble, so I won't hold up a 375 cartridge here. But if you look at a picture of one, compare it to say something that's really modern, like a 300 PRC or something like that, that 300 PRC is going to have real straight, uh, straight walls on it and a real uh, yep. steep shoulder angle. The, the 375 is going to be kind of more tapered up like that to aid in feeding and extraction. And it's really long too. You have, now you can kind of divide a lot of cartridges into short, standard, and magnum length uh, actions. 6.5 Creedmoor, 308 are all short action, 30-06, 270 are standard. And then the 375 is a magnum length action. So it's a really long cartridge uh, to accommodate uh, all the things I was just talking about. And it's you know, pretty powerful too. It'll shoot a 300 grain bullet, 2,500 feet per second, 25, 2550, 2,600, Ooh. something like that. And so it's, it's shooting a pretty heavy bullet, you know, at a, at a moderate, to, you know, at the fast velocity, you're 35 Whalen shooting what a uh, 200 grain bullet at 2,700, 2,700. Yeah. 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 So yeah. Bullet that's 50% heavier, just a little bit slower. Yeah. Yeah, the 200 grain bullet at 27. Yeah. 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 So 35 Whalen, you know, I mean, that's a pretty powerful cartridge, but I mean, like it's, it's like a big step up from that going up to the 375. And so in modern times, the 375 or the 93 by 60, the 93 by 62 is a smaller uh, cartridge that's almost on the level of the 375. But those two cartridges are considered kind of the minimum if you were going to go hunt dangerous game in Africa buffalo hippo elephant something like that um but the 375 is in kind of a sweet spot where it's really powerful and it's really effective but it also doesn't recoil so much that your average guy can probably shoot it pretty well whereas that may not be the case with a 416 or 458 or something like that and you got a scope on it so it's, mm -hmm. it's not knocking your eyeballs out no, not at all. You know, and so you get a good low power scope on it. Like I have low power variable scope on it. A lot of guys will use like a one to six power or something like that over there. Uh, just, you know, because you're you know, on Buffalo quite often, you're taking a shot at 50 yards, maybe sure, probably less than 100, you know, 50, 75, something like that. So it's not real long, but it helps you be a little bit more precise and gather more light when you're kind of trying to thread the needle in there through some thick brush or something like that. Um, so a cartridge rifle scope combination like i just described be super effective over there if a guy wanted to go take one rifle like i said hunt buffalo and shoot an impala shoot a kudu wildebeest something like that while you were over there really really good almost every almost every camp in africa is going to have a 375 as a uh, as a camp rifle either the guide will use it or it's there as clients uh, for a client rifle if they don't bring their own and so um you know, so it's, it's a real cool cartridge. Got a lot of history. It's probably taken more Cape Buffalo than any other cartridge out there. And wow. um, yeah, it's and, and I just took we just took two bison with it uh, just last week. <laughs> awesome. Let's see what I mean, guys. This guy is so full of knowledge; it's ridiculous. Like I can't remember what I had for breakfast, and <laughs> sit here and just spit it out like this. So. We didn't get into it in Colorado too much, but you talked about it a little bit in Colorado and you just kind of alluded to it a little bit. How did you get into the well have you how how many have you been to Africa? How many times have you been? How'd you get into it? Uh, and kind of tell us how are you involved there? Because you got a lot of knowledge in that space too that I have absolutely zip. Yeah, so I've been to Africa four times. Uh, and I'm going for my fifth time this this upcoming May. Um, so I went to West Point for college and your junior the year there, they call you, I don't know why they call you this, but you're called a cow. Uh, that's just the, the, the name for the juniors there. And USAA gives people uh, all the cows right before spring break, you get a, what they call a career starter loan. USAA is a big bank that really caters towards the military and everything. Yeah. I and use so they, USAA. Yeah. There you go. Right. Um, so I got a, $30,000 loan and uh, 1% interest, right? Nice. Every, everybody, everybody got it. It was a good, good deal, right? And so guys were getting married and uh, buying cars and things like that with theirs. What's that? I said, get a Corvette. Yeah. <laughs> well, I decided I was going to go to Africa with mine. And so that's how I financed my first trip over to Africa. And it became kind of a, 
it's, it's like a topic of just hot topic of discussion there that last semester where everyone's like, oh man, you get to Kowloon, what are you going to do with it? And uh, it start word started getting around that a guy was going to Africa with his. And uh, I was talking with a friend of mine, and I was like, uh, what are you doing? It's like, oh, you know, I'm going to Europe or whatever. But man, I heard some guys going to Africa. That it can't be true. I was like, it is true. It's me. I'm going this summer. <laughs> That's awesome. And so this was 2006. And if you can remember back that far, that was back when Brad Pitt and Angelina Jolie had their baby. And it was a very big deal in tabloids, all this stuff. Well, they had their baby in Namibia, which is in Africa. And that's where I was going. And mm. so people kept asking me, are you going to Namibia? Because that's where Brad Pitt and them had the baby. I was like, no, man. <laughs> I, I was going there to hunt and they just kind of made it famous and everything. And so back then, Namibia really was kind of a, under the radar destination and really the reason they had their baby there was because it was so isolated and hard to get to they were in kind of a little resort town that was on the coast surrounded by desert and so it was real hard to get in and out so you could be private there um the rest of namibia isn't that hard to get to but it's still kind of a pain to get there from the united states but the hunting there is really good and back then you could go to namibia for dirt dirt cheap it was by far the cheapest place to go in africa uh, people have discovered it. The prices have gone up. There's still a good place to hunt. And so that was my first first trip over there. Um, had a good time. I deployed to Iraq a couple of years later. When you're in Iraq or when you're deployed, you make combat pay and you don't pay federal income tax while you're deployed. And so I wasn't married. I put all my stuff in storage. I sold my car. And so I basically saved all my money for a year and I wasn't paying taxes. And so I had a good chunk of change when I when I got home and I went back to Africa and I went Cape Buffalo hunting in Zimbabwe uh, with that one. And then um, I turned around and went back, deployed, went to Afghanistan. And at this point, I was like, man, you know, it's been good, but I, I don't think I want to do this for another you know, 15, 10, 15 years. And so I started thinking about things to do when I got out. And I actually bought an ebook when I was deployed in Afghanistan. It was like $20. I have no idea how I found it or what the name of it was or any of this stuff, but it was like how to make money hunting. And, and wow, that, I need to read that, that book. Yeah, <laughs> it changed my <laughs> life, man. Like I said, I, I don't even, I'm sure I've lost it over the years, all of that stuff, but it, it got me started because it, it had a, all these different ways you could make money hunting, going beyond the obvious stuff, oh, be a hunting guide or, or something like that. And it actually had one of the things in it was to start a hunting blog. And it had step-by-step -step instructions how to do that, how to register a domain name, how to set up the software to actually do the blog, what to write about. And so I followed the advice and I started this blog when I was in Kandahar and um, I just started doing this kind of in my, in my free time over there. And it was amazing. You know, this is back in 2012 and things are so different then. you start a Facebook page back then and you had a hundred people that liked your page and you'd post something on Facebook and all hundred people would see what you posted. Yeah. I remember that back in the good old days, man. Yeah. And so I was able to get traction really quick with it. And I made connections with people all over the world. And I had a couple of people approach me and be like, listen, you seem like a nice guy that you know what you're talking about. I like your website. Would you be interested in selling hunts for me? I'm like, yes, I would. And so I went to Africa with my wife uh, a couple of years later, met up with the, one of the guys that contacted me doing that and his operation there. And I started selling hunts for him. And so I've gone back with him since then. And that is who I sell hunts for in Africa now. And that's not the only thing that I do. I do kind of do probably about eight, nine different things uh, to make money these days. Selling hunts in Africa is one of them. Do, do stuff in Canada and whatnot. Also people that I met through the blog. And then the kind of the blog just kind of took on its, on its life of, on a life of its own. And yeah, you know, as things so, kind of. Let me, let me pause there. Sure. Let's kind of blow that out a little bit more. So uh, that being said, we, hit, we got lots and lots of people that watch, watch. Uh, if anybody has questions about Africa, uh, they can come to you and ask questions. You can even book stuff for them, right? Oh, yeah, definitely. And then he also has knowledge much more than me on going out west and applying for tags. Um, I've only gotten tags out west two different times, and I'm still pretty much clueless on that. Uh, but anything having to do with hunting, let's just sum it up like that. Anything having to do with hunting, John is your man, whether it's, rifles, ammo, where to go, even on Africa. 
he can hook it up and get you squared away. Uh, well, you're 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 too kind. You're probably giving me more credit than I deserve with that stuff. I've, I've spent a lot of time flailing around out there though, and uh, and figuring things out the hard way. Well, yeah, you you put the work in to flail around, and now you got the knowledge. That's how it works. I need to you know, do a lot more flailing. Is what I need. The to army. Do. The army took me to a lot of different <laughs> places. I lived in Washington State for a while, and man, those for, those those couple of years up there were rough initially as I was trying to figure things out. And I lived in El Paso. And so I hunted in New Mexico, Arizona, Colorado, Wyoming, all those places. Go out there, pinch a tent, pinch a tent on uh, public land, and all right, I've never hunted mule deer before. <laughs> Let's give it a shot today. <laughs> yeah, the navigating that whole thing. So I live in Tennessee. Ninety nine percent of the animals I've taken have been in Tennessee. So for me, it's Oh, my buddy, say from Texas, you want to come hunt? Yeah. It used to be, we'll go down to Walmart and we'll get you a license and we'll go shoot a bunch of deer. You can shoot three a day. But then it's like, oh, you want to go shoot out west? Well, you got to apply and then you got to find this tiny little zone. What zone do you want to apply for? Mm -hmm. And then do they even have public land there? And it's it, it, it it's a nightmare for me. So I'm assuming it can be a nightmare for a lot of people. And that's just... I get it from the conservation perspective, you know, mm -hmm. we don't want to get rid of the elk and the mule deer and all that. But from my perspective, where I'm from, I can take three does a day from September through January and get two bucks with, yeah. the, one, with the one license. <laughs> so that's what I'm used to, you know, mm -hmm. if you want to hunt at my house, now Tennessee has the app. I could just buy your license on my phone and then you can go shoot three doe with me. You know what I mean? Like, it's that easy. So, mm -hmm. but then the flip side, people out west who know what they're talking about and grew up that way, when I say, "Oh, we can shoot three deer a day," they're like, "Are you kidding me?" Like, what? <laughs> yeah, you get one deer a year if you're lucky in a lot of those things. Yeah, but I don't know. Some someday I'll figure it all out. I I will be in Montana here in a few weeks. I did have a deer tag this year for Montana. And so you said that you've drawn two different tags. You drew the deer tag in Montana and then the antelope tag in Colorado you just punched? Well, so technically three. Oh, okay. All right. <laughs> three years ago, I got a deer elk combo tag from Montana just by putting it in. First time I ever put in, mm -hmm. got it, which was a surprise to a lot of people. But Montana, how they work... I think it's kind of rigged. They, that is weird, man. You have to put in. So the map is just crazy. I My buddy lives out there. That's who I had get on the computer with me and tell me exactly what to type in in every section when I applied. Here's the units and all this stuff. The combo tag for Montana for deer and elk, it costs $1,500 to apply. And that's due, I think, in April. And they hold your $1,500. And then they draw, I think they draw in August. They hold your money all summer. If you draw, they keep your money. If you don't, then they refund you your 1500 bucks. Which, to me, that seems like a crock. Like, <laughs> you're holding like a million dollars of people, you know, making interest or whatever on it. And then, eh, you got it or you didn't. I just feel mm -hmm. like that's a scam. And last year, I applied and didn't draw. And then all throughout the season, they go down the alternate list. They called me with two weeks left in the season and said, hey, man, your name came up on the alternate list. I'm like, there's two weeks. Like, I got to work, and I don't have a guide. And and I was just – and they were going to charge me the 1500 bucks again, of course. Uh, but it just didn't work out. I wish I could have, but it didn't work out. But every state's funky. I've only taken one mule deer and now one antelope. But I would love to take another uh, mule deer. Maybe maybe that's what we'll get on in Montana. Montana got whitetail and mule deer. And so your tag is just a deer tag and you can yeah. shoot either? Yep. You know, so when I moved to El Paso, I moved there in 2017. And I knew I'd be there for four years. My wife was still in the Army. Her obligation would be up in 2021. And we were, we would move. And so said so when I get there, I want to shoot a mule deer, a pronghorn, an elk, a coos deer and a 
uh, Havelina all in those four years. And so I did it. Uh, it was it was a busy four years, but I did them all. So you see, let's see here, that one right there. That's nope, yeah. sorry, that's my mule deer. I got New Mexico. Okay. And then this one here is my pronghorn. That was the first one I ever got. I got that one in Wyoming. So I got the the mule deer in 2017, the pronghorn in 2018, 2019. I actually got another pronghorn in Colorado that's not up there. Then I got my coos deer in Arizona. And then 2020, I drew my elk tag and I shot it in New Mexico. And then right above my head, right there, that's a javelina skull. Actually, I'll get it and bring it to you. It's pretty cool. Sweet. I've never seen a javelina other than there was, a, <clears throat> there was a lot of them in that part of New Mexico oh where I hunted. Yeah. I didn't know they were that nasty. Yeah, they had. I ended up shooting just kind of by happenstance, two pretty big boars. And um, there was a there was a good number of them in that area that I hunted deer. And uh, I learned this by going out there, scouting for deer. I went out like the day before deer season, was camped out there. And I was, I was just looking uh, the evening before, didn't see anything. Walking back to my car in the dark. And uh, I hear rustling in front of me. And then I hear, burr, burr, and then something just take off running. And I shine my light on it. I see it was a pig running away and i guess this javelina was going the other way and kind of bumped into me in the dark and i scared him and he grunted at me and ran away and oh. um every i i drew that tag three years in a row out there and so every year i would see javelina out there and i think in uh early 2020 you know it was like february 2020 right before the pandemic i was out there and i shot i shot this one that I just showed you and i shot another one there before i left uh but uh, i was like man i see these darn javelina all the time out here, I need to get a tag and shoot one. And, and it was a lot of fun to hunt them, uh, too. See, even to me, that makes no sense. So, like, from my perspective, if you see a hog in Tennessee, you can kill it. It doesn't matter. No license. Just kill the thing. Same mm -hmm. as coyotes. Just kill it. 365 days. You're not drawing a tag. So, to me, that seems kind of ridiculous. Like, I got to draw a tag to shoot some junk. Trash animal, what most people would consider? Well, javelina are different from hogs. They're not an invasive species, for one thing. They are they are native to that area. Their meat is not great, but I wouldn't call them a trash animal. And they're also not nearly as prolific as hogs are. Um, they're not endangered or anything like that. But if you got after them <laughs> the way people get after hogs, you could, uh, you could trim their numbers down in a hurry, man. Um, but they are a lot of fun to hunt, though. Um, <clears throat> And I've shot, I've shot a lot of hogs too. And they're, it, it's a big difference between them. I have heard, I don't know if this is actually true, but I've heard that javelina are more closely related to giraffes than they are to feral hogs. No way. Yeah. They're, they're kind of their own thing. Yeah. I'm going to scan for the chat real quick. We got over a hundred people in here. I do need, I'll be in Texas. I think I told you. I don't know exactly when, November. When does your deer season end? Uh, it starts the first weekend in November, and the rifle season goes to the first weekend in January. So we got a two-month-long rifle deer season here. I was there last year during bow season, uh, and we were doing some of the exotic hunting, but I brought my crossbow just in case we saw a whitetail. We mm. saw the bows, but... Uh, Nothing that I wanted to shoot at. Somebody said something about just another Patriot. I don't know what you're talking about, but night optics. That's another thing that's illegal in Tennessee. I have thermals, but they're illegal to use at night. Really? Yeah. Interesting. We're not allowed to hunt anything at night except raccoon. And that's only in raccoon season, which pretty much coincides with deer season. But yeah, if it's in the regulations, very black and white. If you get caught with a thermal after the sun goes down, you'll be in big trouble. You can't even have it on a rifle in your truck. Interesting. Against the law. Yep. You know, I've, I've long considered getting a thermal for mainly for hogs around here, but um, I've just ne never have done it. I probably will, but I haven't done it yet. A lot of them out there is cool because I won't say all of them, but many of them have recording capability 
Mm-hmm. So even if you're using them in the daytime, it's kind of cool because you can record. Matter of fact, last night I had mine out. I was recording. I, I saw two spikes fighting, and I recorded oh, that's cool. on the thermal. I'll probably have that, see if I can upload that footage. But I, I'd never seen spikes sitting there go at it. There was like 10 minutes. Whitetail spikes. But Randall, this is my buddy here, Randall. I've hunted with him before. He lives in a place that's more got more hogs. As a matter of fact, we were I went hog hunting with Randall a couple times. Uh, Hootie who I thought hogs here in Tennessee had to be hunted with whatever deer season was going on. I don't know. You might be right. So I know that is a regulation with uh, coyotes. So if you shoot a coyote during deer season, you can't be out there with like a a 22 LR or 22 mag and shoot a coyote during deer season because they don't, they want you to stay within the deer regulations, even if you're shooting something else. So I guess that also means too, if you're bow hunting deer, you, you couldn't have a gun on you to shoot a coyote. If you shoot a coyote, you got to do it with a bow during bow season. Yes. That's the way that it's written. I believe. And they, they yeah, just, least- they just changed ours too, where, it used to be we couldn't have a pistol on us even during bow season. They just recently changed that. Yeah, I remember when I lived in Georgia, they had it written where uh had to have um, – you could carry a pistol. Actually, it may not have been Georgia. It may have been Washington. If you had a concealed carry permit, you could have a pistol on you. But that was the only way you could do it legally if you were bow hunting. Yeah. I Ours was written you couldn't have it even with the permit. Oh, man. Off the record, I always did anyways, but <laughs> my pistol, that's to protect myself, you know, from dangerous man in the Who woods. Knows? Who knows, man? Yeah. And, uh, here where I live, a buddy of mine last year got a Black Panther on trail camera. Like, oh, man. Every once in a while, we'll have somebody catch a mountain lion like a normal brown one. This dude had a Black Panther. Like, up the street from where I used to live and like a 10 minute drive from where I'm sitting right now. Man, that's super cool just to get a mountain lion on camera at all, much less a a rare color like that. Yep. Let me look at the chat quick here. Larry says they can hunt at night with thermals. Texas, you guys are pretty wide open when it comes to that stuff, right? Oh yeah. You know, especially like with hogs, you don't even need a license to hunt hogs on private land uh here oh. yeah so you can hunt them at night you can hunt them with thermals uh all, all, all of that stuff there's mr big kid in the chat he was hunting with us too in colorado javelina equals stink pig even though they aren't actually pigs yeah they have a, a big uh scent gland on their back if you're not real careful butchering them and like you touch that with your hands and then you touch the meat oh my god He's terrible. <laughs> my sister, but if you're real, go ahead. No, sorry. Right, go ahead. I was just gonna say, my sister, her husband is in the army, still is, and he, no, she said that the javelina in New Mexico, like, would come in their yard, and they were pretty brave, like to the point where it could be scary to the kids and whatnot. I believe it, man. Like they'll pop their jaws and stuff and grunt at you, um, like it. I've uh, gotten close to them, uh, not not knowing it. Sometimes just kind of walking around out there deer hunting, and man, they can—they're real scary looking. If you if you bump into them, don't know they're there. I was at a hotel in Arizona, and some of them actually—it um, was kind of right up against the state park, and some of them kind of went into the hotel grounds and got into the fenced area around the pool, and they <laughs> had to send oh. some guys in there to to chase them out. Yeah. <laughs> That would make a good video. I got a good picture of them, uh, of them uh, getting them out, but I didn't get a video of it. So, hold on a second, Aubrey. I see you did a a, <laughs> a super chat. I missed in there somewhere. Aubrey, I appreciate you big time. Where did it go? It brings up something. Uh, there it is. Appreciate the super chat. Aubrey's in all the videos. It says get a couple hours of sleep. You work too hard. I'm actually not going to sleep at all tonight because I got to edit all night. Then I got to film all day tomorrow. 
I get, I'm trying to get ahead like three weeks ahead, but I can't sleep, Aubrey. But I do appreciate the super chat. Yeah, see you drinking coffee and Mountain Dew here at uh, almost nine o'clock yeah. at night. You're, you're not going to be sleeping that much, man. <laughs> but uh, somebody had a chat in there that I missed, and they, which is a really common comment that I get all the time. I'll, I'll do, you know, today I filmed a 4570 video, or it'll be a whatever. The only big one that I have is my 500 Jeffrey. But every time I shoot the 500 Jeffrey, somebody without a doubt says, oh, that's a pea shooter. You should have brought out the 700 Nitro. <laughs> but, which that doesn't really mean anything to, to me other than it's 700 is bigger than 500. But what do you know about the Nitros? Because there are people always telling me that I need a Nitro. But I'm assuming that's a real thing. Oh, yeah. So, you know, so I was telling you, the 375 kind of came along when they were switching over from black powder to smokeless powder. A lot of those new cartridges they called the Nitro Express, nitro, nitrocellulose being the, the smokeless powder that they use. So you had things like the 500 Black Powder Express, and then you had a 500 Nitro, et cetera, right? So that, Does the 500 Nitro shoot the same projectiles as the 500 Jeffrey? So there's a lot of overlap with with, okay. with those bullets. They'll shoot 500. Like, say my dad has a 500 black powder. I think it shoots a four. I think he has a 440 grain bullet and a 540 grain bullet for it. And I know the 500 uh, Jeffrey will do that too. The 700 Nitro is almost kind of like a joke in the hunting community because of how big it is. For a long time, so you had like the, the 470 Nitro is real, real popular. Uh, with uh, in double rifles for dangerous game hunters in Africa right now. Um, and then some people use the 500 Nitro. The 600 Nitro was like the thing for a long time. And shoot a 900 grain, oh, yeah. six, 60, gra 60 caliber, 900 grain bullet at like 2,100 feet per second, something like that. So it was like a, it was like a cannon, right? Um, Holland and Holland made those guns. And so if, if you ever... If you ever really want to dream about something expensive, go look at the Holland and Holland website. They have a gun room in Dallas, like the Royal Deluxe Rifle retails for like two hundred thousand dollars, something Whoa. like that. Yeah, right. So my first house didn't cost that much, <laughs> but like um, Theodore Roosevelt, when he went to Africa, he had a Holland and Holland. Uh, you know, the the King of England, the Queen of England, they had Holland and Hollands. It's like the Ro Rolls Royce of um, of rifles there. So right. really, really rich people uh, buy them. They're they They go and they measure you like you're being measured for a suit. And then they build oh, the rifle wow. specifically to fit you. Yeah. Wow. Um, and so um, for a long time, the 600 nitro was the biggest one that they made. And then they stopped making it at some point. And uh, they told the guy that they sold that last rifle to, this is the last Holland and Holland 600 Nitro we're ever going to make. And so yours is more valuable because of it, right? Some some guy, I, we can look it up here later. Um, if you look up probably the Wikipedia entry for 700 Nitro, I'll tell you the guy's name. He wanted Holland and Holland to make him a 600 Nitro. And they're like, sorry, we're not doing this. You know, we already promised this guy. He's like, well, what about a 700 Nitro instead? What? And so he designed this cartridge uh, specifically to do it kind of to be ridiculous, but also just kind of because he wanted to it. And let me look up real quick, the ballistics of it, just so I'm not, uh, making it up. I think it's a thousand grain bullet at 2000 feet per second, but let me make sure. A thousand grain bullet. Oh my goodness. So there are 7,000 grains in a pound. Uh, so a thousand grain bullet. But my 500 Jeffries, I just looked, are 540s. 540s? Yeah. Right. Yeah, that's what I thought. 700 Nitro, 1,000 grain bullet at 2,000 feet per second. Yeah. 8,900 foot-pounds of muzzle energy for it. <laughs> oh, 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 oh. oh I, that's ridiculous. That's it. That's 50% more energy than the 500 Jeffrey. I think the energy at the muzzle is close to 6,000. Yeah, so the this, the ballistics here I have for the – there's there's two different loads for the 500 Jeffrey. There's a 600-grain bullet at 2,100 feet per second for 5,800 foot-pounds, and then a 535-grain bullet at 2,300 
for 6,200 feet foot pounds of energy. Yeah, so right at 6,000. And so you see what I'm talking about with the 375 kind of being that minimum level for hunting dangerous game over there, you know, a little over 4,000. So that, that 700 nitro has about twice as much, over twice as much. Um, but I'll, t- I'll tell you this. So like a, my 375 has 35 foot pounds of recoil energy. Like I said, that's kind of towards the upper end of what a lot of people can handle. So 35, the 700 nitro has 183 foot pounds of recoil energy. Whoa. <laughs> Have you have you seen that video of the Middle Eastern guys in the in the booth shooting that a massive jumps out of his hand? Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. So that was, I want to say that was like a golly. Let me let me look it back up. I don't want to I don't want to lie to you what the what the cartridge was with it. Uh but uh let's see here. Uh yeah, 585 in Yati. Yeah, so 750 grain bullet at 2,000 feet per second. Um, yeah, so like you said, goodbye shoulder. Exactly, right? Uh, and that was what was happening to those poor guys because I, th- I think someone was playing a joke on them where they're just like, yeah, just just shoot this gun and not 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 telling them how much it was going to kick. And so they'd hold it real light and, you know, kind of blow them away <laughs> like that. Uh, this is kind of an interesting thing. So 300 Winchester short mag. I like 300 Winchester short mag. I shot a deer with it. I got a video up on it actually in Texas, but that's kind of an oddball one. A lot of people haven't even heard of that's got really close ballistics to 300 wind mag. Mm -hmm. What's uh, what's your spiel on the short mag stuff? All right. So Winchester, so I was talking about the different action links earlier. So you have short action, standard, long. So the 300 wind mag is a long or a standard length action. Same length as a 30 out six. Winchester decided to make a line of short action cartridges that duplicate uh, the performance of long action cartridges. So in this case, the 300 Winchester short mag basically duplicates it as a shorter, fatter case. And um, it's right up there with it, maybe 50 feet per second slower, something like that. But you know, for all intents and purposes, it's the same. It does really good. So everything that you can say that's good about the 300 Win mag is good about the 300 Winchester short mag as well. Great for deer, great for elk, moose, whatever. It's a little bit more efficient, though, because it's shorter, shorter and fatter like that. And so you can get away with a shorter barrel length with the 300 Winchester short mag and have basically the same performance as the 300 wind mag, say like a 22-inch barrel for the short mag versus a 24-inch barrel for the Winchester Magnum. So some people love it. There's nothing wrong with it. It works great. Um, I like it just because it's weird and different. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I've never taken an animal with my 300 wind mag that I remember, <laughs> but I have the 300 short mag. Yeah, for all intents and purposes, it's going to be the same. Uh, you're going to have probably a little bit better selection of um, ammo and whatnot with the 300 wind mag these days. So That's if you can find point. the ammo, that short mag will work great. That's a good point. So uh, I'm going to say it again for everybody jumping in here late. We got John with us. He's got the Big Game Hunting blog. His website, go check it out. His YouTube channel is linked in the description. Make sure that you're subscribed and you got the notifications on. What is – let me let me ask you a couple questions. And, y'all, if you have questions for John before we jump off here, we've been on here close to an hour. I don't want to hold him too long. If you got some questions for John, put them in the chat, and we'll try to get, them, get to them here in a second. But <clears> – <throat> Somebody knew somebody. There's a question I get a lot all the time. Prop not maybe not every day, but at least every week, probably several times a week. People will ask me and say, Hey, I am new to deer hunting. More cases than not, it's whitetail. Mm-hmm. What should I pick up for my first hunting rifle? So if somebody asked you that question, what would you tell them? I mean, there's a lot of stuff that'll work really well for that. I shot my first year with a 308, and it was great. I still have it. Um, my sister used that same rifle to shoot her first animal. My buddy in college used that same rifle to shoot his first year. My brother-in-law, married to my sister, used that same rifle last year to shoot his first year. And it worked great yeah. with all of those. And um, I've got it threaded and everything now, so you can hunt with a, with a suppressor. My son may use that to shoot his first year with. So 308, awesome. Wonderful cartridge. Um, 
and especially these days, 308 ammo, really easy to get. It's probably the easiest stuff you can find anywhere. Um, you know, people love to hate it. Let me plug something real quick. Mm -hmm. I noticed you plugged it on your um, podcast today. The part that I hadn't, I wasn't there for the recording about finding ammo. So uh, give us your plug. I know you mentioned that bit on your uh, podcast today. Give us that plug here on the live. When it comes sure. To so go to the website, huntingguns101.com, 101.com. I have an ebook there that you can sign up for. If you do that, they'll put you on my mailing list. And so that ebook will also do a really good job of walking you through the some of the really popular hunting cartridges for different people in different situations, depending on your personal preferences, what exactly you're hunting, where you're hunting, that sort of thing. I've got a bunch of different recommendations in there and uh, that can kind of get you started down that that uh, that lane. The, third, the 308 is great. It's by no means the only one that will work for it, though. So go to huntingguns101.com. That will also put you on my email list. I send out an email every week, every weekday, excuse me. And every Friday, I have an in-stock ammo email update. So if you sign up right now tonight, uh, you'll you'll get my email tomorrow where I'll talk about in-stock ammo that I've found. And so uh, it's right. It's better than it was a year ago, but it's still kind of hard to find stuff. And hunting season is getting here. And so I, I kind of um, go through a bunch of the big retailers online, find what they have that's good, maybe something that's hot that a lot of people want. And I'll, and I'll blast that out to people. You can also reply to my emails with specific requests. Hey, I'm looking for seven millimeter mag ammo. I'm hunting elk, you know, gosh, you know, what, what should I use? Whatever. Um, I can't promise you I'll find it, uh, but I've been able to help a lot of people do that. And so one last time, huntingguns101.com. They'll get you the caliber question. And, it'll, and we can also, uh, I'll, I'll help you find the uh, ammo that's in stock for you as well. There you go. And that I miss the days. So here in Murfreesboro, it's where the Barrett factory is, Barrett Firearms. Mm -hmm. They have a retail store. And two and a half years ago, we all know what happened in all that time span. They, <laughs> their retail store was my go-to place. They literally had everything from 338 Win Mag to 22 250, 303 British, 4570. They literally had everything. And quite honestly, took pride in their ammo selection. If any, even 50 BMG, I mean, everything, literally, you could walk into that store, get what you wanted. And it was awesome, especially for making YouTube videos, me buying all these squirrely rifles and stuff. <laughs> they would have, they would have your 458 and your 375 in stock. But even now, where we're at, you go in there. I haven't seen them have 270 or 65 cream more in a while. Uh, so, and that's a pretty big city. So, you guys definitely take advantage of everything he just said. Guarantee you to help you out. And <laughs> thanks, Excavation, for the just because super chat. Appreciate you big time. Excavation's in every, uh, every single chat every night. Let's get to the chat quick. I told you guys to throw some stuff in there. Before we jump off here, Steve says 300 wind mag, wind mag will knock them in the dirt. I believe it, but I haven't experienced it myself. That That's one on the list I need to do this year. That but, might be my most favorite cartridge. 300 wind mag? Everything that I hunted when I was in El Paso, I shot with that 300 wind mag. I took it to New Zealand and shot my tar, shot elk, mule deer, uh, even javelina with it, pronghorn. It's great. Wonderful cartridge, man. There's not... You can basically take anything this side of Cape Buffalo with a 300 wind mag with good bullets, man. And let me let me kind of tell you where I'm at in my headspace when it comes to our rifle season doesn't open up until November, and then it's just going to be boom. We're going to I'm going to film as many whitetail hunts as I can. Um, we might be taking one tomorrow with the crossbow. We'll see what happens. It's bow season here right now, um, but. Kind of where I'm at in my space now is I got the suppressors, so I'm kind of nerding out on the subsonic stuff. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then also, I'm kind of liking the lighter stuff, like 
Tennessee, we can deer hunt with 204 Ruger, 22, 250, stuff like that. So kind of my first deer this year, I kind of want to do subsonic 300 blackout. And there are quite a few people making good subsonic stuff. We talked about this in Colorado. Yeah, you have that Hornady subsonic stuff from the sub yeah. exploit. Yeah. That would probably be the stuff I grab after consulting the expert. And then so, – uh, so you saw my Instagram yesterday yep. with my uh, feet are getting pushed over. Uh, yep. So I spent all day up there fixing it and, and everything. I got it kind of jury rigged until I got it broke off one of the metal legs on the darn thing, man. I was so yeah. mad. Yeah. But so I got it kind of jury rigged and kind of uh, uh, tied to a tree with some wire to kind of keep it up. I'm going up there. As soon as I get kind of pictures of that hog coming back, I'm taking my 300 blackout and it's going to be with that Hornady subsonic ammo. Well, let me know how it does. I've got the notifications on on your Instagram, so definitely text me or post it on there. I'm checking the, the chat again here. Somebody said something that I forgot. Uh, Randall says his 300 will pick up pick the animal up and th throw them, sure enough, with hand loads. And Aubrey says, drop my first two mule deer with 7mm mag. Dropped them on the spot. I bet it did. Yep. Bridger says thoughts on Savage Axis 243. So I've actually got a video on us. I don't own a Savage Axis, period, but I have filmed quite a few. I have a video on a Savage Axis 243. And that particular one that I had, I could put them just about in the same hole every time. And I believe I was shooting normal whitetail ammo. So a lot of people love to hate Savage Axis, heavier triggers, but. On the other hand, they're one of the cheapest, most affordable hunting rifles out there. Um, and if you find an ammo that they like, I think they do just fine. I've done that in some videos. So go check out my – if you type in Savage Axis 243, it'll probably be the first or second video pop up. But I uh, I like it because I had one that shot really good groups for me. But that's most of the stuff that I tend to do is the cheapest stuff because – I'm the one that's got to pay for it, so I'm normally going to buy something cheap. <laughs> well, you could go and shoot a Boone and Crockett deer with the Savage Axis, man. Like, uh, the the deer don't care as long as you get something that shoots well and you, you use good ammo. And I think Savage Axis would be a great, uh, especially a good starter gear rifle. Yep. I've got a bunch of Ruger Americans which they used to be a lot cheaper. Now people are charging five, 600 bucks for Ruger Americans. Um, and if you, if you're going to pay that much, I, I generally tell people get a CVA cascade or even a couple more hundred bucks and get a Bergara. Have you ever shot the cascades yet? No, I haven't. They are sweet. Yeah. They go for about 600 bucks. I had my 22 to 50 out today and I shot under Half inch groups with it with random factory ammo that I had. Man. But I'll tell you, it's amazing how good even cheap guns can be these days. Hey, like you said, sometimes, like I had a Weatherby Mark V, 6.5 Creedmoor. It hated almost everything. I fed it nine, nine or 10 different types of ammo, and only one or two would do like half inch groups. The rest of them, two inch groups, garbage with a $3,000 rifle. Jeez, man. But then you'll luck out and find a, a Ruger American that will do great groups with everything. I saw a couple things pop up. Uh, we'll answer a couple questions and we'll jump off here. I don't want to hold you all night. Uh, 300 PRC. What's your thoughts on 300 PRC? I just got one. I got to get a stock for it, but I just got one. 300 PRC is a real good cartridge. So Hornady made two real good cartridges with the 6.5 and the 300 PRC. The 7 PRC is probably going to get announced here in a couple of weeks by Hornady. Yeah. And uh, it's probably also going to be a, a big winner. But I'll tell you, if you want to buy a real good heavy hitting 30 caliber Magnum cartridge that you can just go off the shelf, buy, a, buy an off the shelf rifle with off the shelf Hornady ammo and have it probably shoot really, really good and then be acceptable for anything you'd hunt reasonably with it in North America, especially out to extended range, real good choice for it. Not everyone has that need, 
but man, like if you're in a situation where you might uh, want to be shooting an elk at 700 yards or something like that, I don't have the skill to be doing that myself, but that cartridge and that rifle are up to it. I've only shot a, at a mile one time, and it was with the 6.5 PRC. My buddy had his set up, and he said, hey, I got the scope dialed. Take a crack at it. And they had a three-foot piece of steel, three foot by three foot at a mile. <laughs> one try hit it, and I put it down. I said, I'm not trying again. But <laughs> it, I just got a Howa 1500 barreled action in 300 PRC. I got to get a stock port and stuff. But So that 300 PRC is going to give you almost as much muzzle velocity as my 375. But it does it with a 30 caliber bullet that's uh, going a lot faster and it's super high VC. So it does real well in the wind and it retains energy really, really well. I think the, I've been buying ammo for it. I think the Hornady, yeah, it's right here. Uh, I got the box right here. Probably the Precision Hunter 212 grain ELDX. It's the Hornady Match 225 grain. Okay. Uh, the BC is 0.777 G1. Yeah. Scale. Yeah, it's like somebody made that up. It's so high. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> All right. One last question. Most fun big game animal to hunt. You could probably take that a few different directions. But... <sighs> man. Maybe antelope, man. Pronghorn are so damn fun to hunt. I had a lot of fun. A lot of fun. Like yeah. in Tennessee, we hunt in the woods. I've taken more deer than I can remember. Whitetail in Tennessee, mm -hmm. all of them except one have been inside 40 yards in the woods, mostly from a tree. I mean, you can't miss. So that that antelope w really was a hoot, and I had an absolute blast because it's totally outside what, what I'm normally used to doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you get out there and um, you can spot so many of them you know, so quickly because you can see so far away and then it's just a matter of kind of trying to close the distance and get a reasonable shot on them. And if you don't get a shot, oh, well, I'll just, I'll just try again on, on another one. You know, there's a lot of action yeah. uh, to it and, you know, it's, 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 it's really fun and it's really cool. That, I, gosh, I mean, there's a lot of stuff that's fun to hunt. That, that, that may be the most fun for me. I want to go, I'll, I'm going to start putting in for Wyoming. I have no idea. You know how hard it is to get a, Antelope tag in Wyoming? Is Not it? hard. I drew a tag up there with one point. Sweet. So, so your deadline to buy a tag or to buy a point for this year, I think, is Halloween. So you could buy one now and use ah. in the draw next year. Sweet. Yeah. I'm going to do that. Do you know how much it was? 30 40 bucks, something like that. That Not cheap? I was going to say a couple hundred dollars. Man. To buy a, buy a point, it's only that much. It's probably about 300 bucks for your tag. That's not bad at all. Yeah. Yeah, do it. Buy a deer tag or buy a deer point while you're at it. Talk to me offline if you want, and we can, we can talk about that stuff. Cool. But, hey, I'm going to cut us off there. I appreciate everybody tuning in. I'm going to say it again. Hit the description. I'll make it a, a comment, too. Go subscribe to his channel. Go check out his podcast. Make sure you're on his newsletter. You won't regret it. If you, if you like our show, his show has actually tons tons more uh, intelligent and smart information where a lot of times we're just doing some of the more goofier stuff. Uh, but if you're hunters like us, you're going to really appreciate everything he's got going on. I wouldn't tell you. I wouldn't steer you wrong. You guys know that. But appreciate y'all. Hey, we'll see you on the next one. Thanks a lot for having me. Huntingguns101.com. Sign up there, and I'll get you fixed yep. up on ammo starting tomorrow. Sweet. All right. Thanks for having me, Adam.